Welcome everyone to the Go Live. And we're going to be talking, or I'm going to be talking a lot, and hopefully some of you will be joining me to discuss some of the pertinent issues around shamanism in our Western culture. I've been doing this work professionally for about 40 years now, which you know, accounts for the gray hair. And during that time, uh, especially early on, I spent a good bit of time just trying to come up with a context for the work that I was doing. For the longest time, I had no idea what a shaman was. All I knew was that there was this interesting old fellow who uh, sort of hung out with me when I'd meditate and who gave me some fascinating exercises to do that really helped with some of the issues that I had going on at the time. So it was a few years down the road when I came across Mirce Eliade's Bible of Shamanism, Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy. And in reading through that, I found myself, I mean, it's very dry reading. It is, uh, it's literally, it's a textbook. And reading it is about as much fun as you would expect from your average textbook. And yet, as I was reading it, I was finding all these field studies done by various ethnographers and archaeologists and whatnot. And they were describing these people who were having these initiatory experiences and they were engaging in these spiritual practices. And they all sounded really familiar. And so as I continued to read and I read about the initiatory experiences of shamans from Mongolia, from Siberia, from Tibet, from all these different places around the globe, I realized that these initiatory experiences sounded very familiar to me. You know, in fact, there was very little other than being struck by lightning I uh, haven't done that yet, no interest in doing so, but there was a lot of commonality. For instance, in general terms, people who are called by the spirits to do this work experience a good deal of trauma, whether it's illness or uh, injury, being struck by lightning, for instance, uh, other misfortunes all as a way seemingly to get the person's attention. Well, my attention was gotten by a number of experiences in my childhood, including the death of my mother when I was 10, my father when I was 13, my older brother when I was six, and a lot of other stuff. So by the time I was in my teens, I already had PTSD, a really good solid case of PTSD and was very dissociative. So I don't actually remember much either about my childhood or about my teenage years. I had been sent along with my sister from Arizona, which is where I was born and grew up initially to live with my aunt, my mother's sister in Cincinnati, Ohio. And this in itself was a bit of a, a culture shift, culture shock. And it was a few years into that experience when I started thinking, okay, I need to do something here because things are just not working. And Shortly after, I think I'd gone into my senior year and I was reading uh, Castaneda. Do not take anything Castaneda has written without an entire shaker of salt, please. Uh, he was not really writing about shamanism and the vast majority of his writings were either made up or copied from other sources. So he has some very wise 
teachings. He copied from really good sources, but there is no indication that any of what he wrote actually happened. So bear that in mind. I digress. So in the midst of reading Castaneda, because there really wasn't much available, and this is before Michael Harner published, and I didn't know what I was doing anyway, I started getting into tarot and astrology and ritual magic, looking for something because I, I knew that I had some kind of profound spiritual connection that was not in alignment with the way that I was raised. Did I mention that I was raised as an Old Testament fundamentalist? No? Well, I should mention that. So anything that I had going on with the spirits from the perspective of the church that I was in was considered either demonic or pure imagination. So I went through many years of just shutting it all down. After my parents died and I was living in Cincinnati, after a few years there, I was beginning to recognize that I had some issues, you know, not just the dissociation, but depression, anxiety, panic attacks, what have you. And when I started meditating, kind of on and off, just kind of feeling it out, I started encountering these other entities. And I, to me, they were all imagination. So I had this big black dog that would show up and then would shape shift into other forms and a couple other things, but there was this very friendly, very well, loving figure of an older man, kind of grizzled and wiry and wiry gray hair, very long and gathered behind his head sometimes. And at first I thought he looked kind of Amerindian, but as I've gotten to know him over the years, I've realized that he's probably more like Tibetan Plateau than Amerindian. But, but in that process, I began to listen to what he had to say. Now, mind you, at the time, I viewed him as a psychological allegory. I thought, okay, I'm a little bit crazy and I'm having visions and hearing voices. That kind of goes with being crazy. And yet it seemed like a good idea to follow the advice that I was getting from this character. Now, I did ask him what his name was, could not get a clear answer. And so finally I said, well, can I call you grandfather? Good idea. So I still call him grandfather. I have heard some name. I, I get the feeling that his name is something like Shebsa or Shespa or Seshpa, something like that. But it doesn't really seem to matter. He's happy with me calling him grandfather. So when I refer to grandfather, that's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> uh, those of you who have read either of my books, uh, Dance of Stones, A Shamanic Road Trip, or Post-Tribal Shamanism, A New Look at the Old Ways, will recognize the term grandfather uh, from my writings. Now, I did write that first book, Dance of Stones, after I had taken a road trip. I was attending a, uh, well, it was called a mystery school in the Catskills. I won't mention the person's name, but many years ago, like back around 1995, I was looking for good teachers. And I had gone to try to study with this one fellow who had written a lot on ritual magic and esoteric traditions. And it quickly became apparent that if I wasn't a young, attractive female, 
he wasn't interested in working with me. So it was suggested that I try working with his wife, who was a very popular new age uh, maven. And so I attended her mystery school in the Catskill Mountains. And the first time I was there, I was appalled. <laughs> it was, I had gotten out of the whole new age thing and had forgotten how incredibly superficial they could be that, you know, and, and mind you, I, I don't want to say that all new age stuff is bad. I leave that to Nick. He said, but one of the things that is rampant in the new age movement and has been since I started getting into it back in the late seventies and through the early to mid eighties is a sense of superficial kind of dilettante uh, attention to the traditions that they look at and they kind of pick and choose and well perfect example of how this person was uh, doing her work she had decided she was going to take us on a shamanic journey and so she started drumming her frame drum and I went into shamanic body and went on a journey. And then without doing a recall, without doing anything, she just stopped drumming and started talking about your experience. And it took me a minute to get over the shamanic bends from being yanked out of my shamanic body and back into my physical body without any warning. And that's when I realized, yeah, she is not only not doing what I consider the real thing, but she doesn't even really understand that there is a real thing. She really considers this all theater. It's all put on. The reason I say this is that it's important to understand that I think for most people, when they first approach shamanism, there's a sense that this is mostly imaginary. For instance, <clears throat> back when I was first introduced to Michael Harner's work and I attended a workshop back in the very late, like 79, 80, something like that, out in the, the suburbs and I remember <laughs> helping tape out a, the shape of a canoe on Berber carpet with duct tape. And then we were supposed to sit there with canoe oars and paddle our spirit canoe into the underworld. And it was very clearly stated that shamanism was creative visualization. Grandfather did not like that workshop. Um, one of the things that I do with my students now is because people will ask, well, if it isn't creative visualization, what is it? And say, so, well, okay, fair question. So just in your mind now, and just picture this really big tree. I mean, maybe you have a tree in your backyard or something that you are on the commons, on the village green, whatever. <clears throat> picture a tree. And now in your mind, just pick that tree up and move it, maybe six feet, okay? No problem. Then when I have them go into shamanic body, which is that vehicle for shamanic consciousness that allows us to very effectively access the shamanic realms, the spirit realms, I introduce them to the world tree in the shamanic body and they go over and they feel the world tree and say, okay, now move that. So far, so far, and it's only been, uh, you know, 38 years or so, but so far nobody has been able to budge the world tree, including me. Okay. And I would submit that that right there is the difference between shamanic journeying and creative visualization. 
Creative visualization is a wonderful tool. It's a powerful tool right in here. What it is not is shamanic journey. And it's difficult for a lot, of, I would say most Westerners to understand that there is something valid, meaningful, powerful, impactful beyond our own heads, beyond the physical reality that we encounter in our daily lives. Something beyond the imagination. And it's very easy when we're used to considering anything beyond the physical senses to be imaginary, to assume that if anything that is beyond the physical reality in the imagination is real, then everything is real, including the purple dragon that you visualize winding its way through your backyard, right? And it's so important to learn to differentiate, to learn, first of all, that there are things that are real and that are, are beyond the physical. And there is a lot that is simply imagination. Once again, imagination is a powerful tool. It's a wonderful part of being human. But that doesn't mean that just because you imagine something that it makes it real. So one of the things that I teach is a kind of meditative practice that I call resting in soul awareness. And it's really drawn on the practices of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, specifically Dzogchen and the Bun practice that predates Tibetan Buddhism, um, mostly drawn on Nyingma traditions. It's the idea that when you go to the root of what your mind generates, when you go to the root, the place that your thoughts arise from, that you will encounter emptiness. Because that's what's, that's what's there. That is the nature of our being. Our thoughts arise from this insubstantial emptiness. Now, a problem that we have here in the West is that a lot of people look at that emptiness and they assume that that means that everything is meaningless, that there's no foundation, there's no substance. But the important aspect here is to realize that that emptiness, that apparent emptiness is filled with awareness, pure awareness. Now, I use the term awareness to differentiate from consciousness, right? Consciousness is what goes on here. Consciousness is what arises from the subject-object uh, relationship between the self and the other, between the subject, the object, between you know my self, my egoic mind, and my water glass here. So, without that subject-object relationship, you can still have awareness. This comes as a great surprise to a lot of us who have never experienced awareness beyond consciousness. But when we do so, you know, we have, our minds are such amazing, amazing tools, creatures, whatever you want to call them, phenomena, right? And uh, let's just try a little opportunity little exercise here if you like you can just listen ignore me whatever but if you find yourself a comfortable seat let your spine be erect and just for a moment i want you to go into your observer mind and what i mean by this for those of you who are not avid meditation practitioners is the part of your mind that watches what is going on there's a part of your mind that right now is listening to my voice perhaps looking at 
my face here on the screen. I want you to go into that part of your mind and I want you to simply observe. And I'm going to guide you through, guide your attention into the state of soul awareness. So as you observe, first of all, just observe the sound of my voice. Notice it arises and it's gone. It doesn't persist. And notice that you have thoughts arising, maybe thoughts about what I'm saying, maybe thoughts about something you're smelling or hearing outside of this little box. But observe those thoughts, observe what you're thinking without thinking it, without going into that part of your mind that's doing the thinking, just be there as the observer. And as you observe it, as you observe the thought arising, notice that it dissolves. Just like the sound of my voice arises and dissolves, your own thoughts arise and dissolve. It's very simple, right? Now, how can I be sure that this is going to happen? Because you're a human being, one assumes, and this is the way human beings operate. This is the nature of human consciousness. So as you observe your thoughts and they arise and they dissolve, just continue doing that for a while. You can close your eyes if you'd like. And continue to allow each thought to arise and dissolve. And you may notice that some thoughts, when you release them, when you dissolve them, keep coming back. And that's okay. That is something we call shempa. And it means that there's a sticky quality. There's a, a glue that keeps you adhered to that thought. And so when that thought comes up again, instead of just looking at the thought, look at the stickiness as well. Look at that underlying adhesion. And as you observe that from observer mind, just look at it, observe it, that dissolves as well. And by now you may notice that your breathing may have changed a little bit. Your body may be a little more relaxed. Probably what's happening is that you're moving from your sympathetic nervous system where everything is very stressful and taut into your parasympathetic nervous system where everything is relaxed. And as you continue to observe the thoughts arising and dissolving, you may notice that the thoughts are coming less frequently. You may even experience a few seconds at a time where nothing arises. And you simply observe that space in between the thoughts. Okay. And then I want you to begin seeking the source of these thoughts. As that next thought arises and you observe it, immediately observe its root. Where does this thought arise from? Look deep into yourself, all the way into the source. That's it. And as you arrive at this source, you will notice emptiness. And just rest there for a moment, observing the emptiness. And notice that unlike your thoughts, when you observe the emptiness, it persists. And then notice that the emptiness is filled with awareness. Just observe that awareness. 
and notice that the awareness is in union with the emptiness. They are inextricably linked. It's as if you were observing the light of the sun in a cloudless, open summer sky. You can no more remove the light from that sky as you observe it than you could remove the awareness from the emptiness. So we refer to this as the luminous field of awareness. And this field of awareness has certain qualities. You will already have noticed that as you observe the awareness, it also does not dissolve, it remains present. And that when you observe the union between the awareness and the emptiness, you may even feel a little frisson of bliss. Not necessarily great euphoric releases, but just a little, wow, everything is okay. Right? As you continue to observe this luminous field of awareness, what I would call soul awareness, notice that just within this field of awareness, there is stillness. And just observe the stillness. Still an observer mind. And thoughts may continue to arise. You observe them, they dissolve, and they're focused back on soul awareness. Stillness. You observe the stillness. Observe that soul awareness is also filled with silence. You observe the silence, it doesn't dissolve. It's still here. You observe the stillness, it doesn't dissolve. You observe the spaciousness. It's as if there's no containment for the soul awareness. It reaches in every direction. You observe it and it persists. And by now, you may be able to observe this state of awareness in enough depth that you realize that there is no self generating this state of awareness. There's no sense of me at the root of this, right? And because there's no self, there is also no other. So there is nothing that is being perceived through this state of awareness. This field of awareness is not conscious of you. It is not conscious of the stillness, the silence, the spaciousness. And yet your observer mind is capable of observing these things. So the meditation technique would be having once arrived here to simply dwell, rest in this luminous field of soul awareness. Right? And then to emerge after at least 20 minutes, maybe 30, 40, an hour, what have you. But that ability to go into observer mind and to observe your thoughts as they arise and to allow them to dissolve is such a valuable tool when it comes to discerning the difference between what is real and what is imaginary. Now, shamanic journeying is a difficult proposition in that sense because we don't take our physical senses with us 
into the shamanic body, into that spiritual realm. We move in there, and for most of us, we are just disembodied mind. Uh, and those of us who follow grandfather's teachings, uh, we have shamanic body. But our egos, our physical brains back here in our physical bodies are still trying to stay connected to this experience and to make sense of it. And the way our egos make sense of things is to tell a story about it, right? to explain it. So when we go into shamanic body and we uh, experience the, uh, the world tree, okay? Our brain is going to try to make sense of that experience. And so some people will look at it, feel it, and experience it as a tree. That's very common. Some see it as a huge oak tree, some as a big pine tree, a redwood, any number of things. Some experience it just as a tall column of light. In actuality, it's neither. What you're experiencing is your brain trying to make sense of something that is beyond its sensory apparatus. Okay, so your brain is taking the input you're sending from the shamanic realms, and it's trying to translate it into sensory input that's going to make sense to you no pun intended, in retrospect. So when we go on those journeys, there's going to be necessarily a certain amount of imagination if we are all, if we are at all visually inclined. Okay, so the extent to which our brain is trying to use visuals to convey information to us, we are going to have to imagine what we're seeing. And if we bring observer mind to bear on that, that image is going to tend to dissolve because it's not rooted in anything beyond our own minds. But if you bring that same observer mind to bear on the experience of the world tree, of grandfather, of any number of other experiences that you encounter there, you'll find that they do not dissolve. Your image of it might fade away, and yet there will still be a palpable perception that there is something present there before you, that, that something has substance, that it has qualities, that it uh, can communicate with you, receive you, engage with you. So you can see how this kind of technique can be very important uh, in the process, especially of journey and in any kind of process of shamanic spirituality. Now, I just want to real briefly ask, is anybody out there? If there's anyone, um, let's see. If you could uh, just text me here and just let me know if anyone's on, otherwise that's fine. Um, but if there is anyone, oh, thank you, Xenia. Um, glad to hear it's interesting. If anyone who's here has any questions about anything I've spoken about so far, about shamanism in general, please feel free to ask and I'll interrupt and respond to those, okay? So I do want to say a little bit about shamanism because shamanism is one of those words that apparently has about as many definitions as there are people to define it. And once again, uh, people in the West, hello Heidi, people in the West have been very disconnected from uh, what well, the roots of shamanic practice, because we're disconnected from our own spiritual roots. Hello, Lindsay. I'm glad you and DJ are listening. 
Oh, nice to see you, Ed. Okay, so thanks everyone. Uh, <laughs> and Barbara says the experience has made her dizzy. Wow, hopefully that's a good start. All right, so shamanism, when you look at the actual shamanic cultures, all these cultures actually have a very clear and, and relatively precise definition of what shamanism is. And this has evolved considerably from what Mircea Eliade wrote about shamanism way back in the 60s. And this definition is essentially that, first of all, a shaman is somebody who is chosen by the spirits to be a shaman. And this doesn't mean that, you know, if you score really well on all your shaman tests, you get to be a shaman and the spirits are the one keeping score. No, what this means is that in between your incarnations, in between your lifetimes, if a shamanic spirit, spirit of a person who was a shaman during their lifetime, or perhaps a deity of some sort, or an ancestral spirit of some sort, if one of these spirits decides, I want to work with you in this lifetime, then you are chosen. And generally what this means is that you will have an interesting life. Uh, don't recommend it, but it does make for an interesting life. Often this means that you come down with a shamanic sickness. And a shamanic sickness is an illness that is undiagnosable by ordinary means, but will lead you deeper and deeper into illness and uh, disharmony and falling apart until you absolutely need to find a shaman or you're going to die. And then you find a shaman and the shaman diagnoses you with shamanic sickness and says, you've been chosen to be a shaman and you need to address this. And you need to start talking to the spirits and making offerings, what have you. So that's the first aspect. Now, once you've been chosen, if you have been chosen and you accept the path, then the work that you're doing is to be able to move into the spirit realm to communicate with spirits in order to bring back information and to make changes that would not be accessible by ordinary means. So this could mean anything from divination to healing, from soul retrieval to depossession. So the final part of this is that you need to be doing this in service to others. If you are born into a tribal culture, then you do this in service to your tribe. In our post-tribal culture, our shamanic community is made up of those people who come to us for our services. So they're not our tribe in the traditional sense, but they're still people that we are in service to. So I hope that makes sense. So what do I mean by post-tribal? I mentioned this earlier, but I coined the term post-tribal tribal because I tried neo-shaman and modern shaman and a few other things, and none of them really felt like they honored that this came from another source and was now being realized in a different way, but still owed its lineage to all the shamans that came before. Because grandfather, my spirit ally, has made it abundantly clear to me that his teachings are for people in our modern Western post-tribal cultures. So he wanted this to be for people who 
are growing up or, or who are living in a culture where the primary element of the culture is the individual. This is not the way it is in a tribal culture. In a tribal, in a traditional tribal culture, the most important element of those cultures is the tribe as a whole, the clan, the collective, the communal. Okay. And most of us here in the West may appreciate that on an intellectual level, but we don't really have a felt sense of what that means. So when I teach my workshops, uh, my first workshop is opening inner doorways. And it refers to grandfather's teachings about how do you get from this place into shamanic body in the shamanic realms. And one of the first things I do is lead people into a state where they're able to directly experience that sense of being a communal soul. Now, I know that we can all do this because all of us have ancestors and the nature of the ancestral soul is essentially communal. It's only this little individualized uh, ego, the egoic soul or the earthly soul that is not communal. And yet we are born with the burning, unquenchable desire for that communion and we find it in whatever way we can some of us find it through family some of us find it through our work some of us find it through spirituality or even religion but that community that communion of soul is accessible to each and every one of us because of the nature of our ancestral soul <clears throat> excuse me and I, I want to preface this by saying you have more than one soul, okay? You have an ancestral soul, and that ancestral soul is made up of all of your blood ancestors going all the way back into the mists of history. Okay. There goes another, another cycle. And at the same time, it's like ancestor soup. You know, you have the broth, and then you have chunks and the chunks are individuals who are either still alive or who have died and passed on within the last four five, six, sometimes even seven generations. And it seems to be that what keeps them capable of maintaining an, an individuated presence is that uh, they still have descendants who are alive and who are talking about them, who remember them. And certainly having a, a descendant who has an ancestor altar and puts offerings on the ancestor altar for you and tells stories about you, definitely keeps you in the loop and keeps you um, nice and chunky. So the, the other part though, the other primary element of this, the other soul that we enter with is what I call the celestial soul. And this is the part that has had many lifetimes before this, is currently uh, in conjunction, in union with this ancestral soul, is created this egoic soul, earthly soul, this individual that you are now in this lifetime. And that after the death of this particular person, that will go into the underworld, into the realm of the ancestors. And then that celestial soul will disconnect from that ancestral soul. And the celestial soul will rise up to the upper world and then come back down into a new body, a new fetus. Actually, the, the celestial soul enters the body with the first breath you take after leaving your mother's womb. And it is the ancestral soul that is already in the body at that point, receiving that. And when those two come together, 
they begin to create the individuated soul of that lifetime. So any questions? So we are coming down to the last 15 minutes. Any questions before I continue? No? Okay. Well, please feel free to ask and they will scroll those up on the screen for me. Let's see. Would you recommend people interested in the Shaman? Ah, what do you recommend people interested in the shamanic pathway start with? It depends on what your interest is because I'll preface it with this. Just because you are not chosen to be a shaman doesn't mean that you shouldn't be interested in shamanism or that there's no reason to take uh, classes or workshops in shamanism or read books on shamanism. There are a whole lot of very fanciful and ungrounded books out there that are based on people's, uh, what do they call it? Uh, unverified personal gnosis, you know, their own imaginary experiences. And there are also a few real gems that are real classics of the genre. For instance, uh, Saren Garrel has a book called Chosen by the Spirits. And I highly recommend it. I actually met her at a conference up in Detroit many years ago when she was still alive in this world. And uh, we had a very enjoyable conversation. But she has a good book. I have two books out, <clears throat> in case you didn't know. <laughs> One is Dance of Stones, a shamanic road trip. And the other one is Post-Tribal Shamanism, a new look at the old ways, both of which are available in a variety of bookstores, possibly your public library, if you request it, and definitely through our old friend, Amazon. I actually wrote Dance of Stones, as I was saying, on this uh, road trip with a friend that I met at the mystery school. She was the only good thing I got out of that <laughs> experience. Uh, she invited me that next summer to come over to Germany and meet her family and go on a road trip with her. So we, I went over there and uh, met her and we went for a road trip in her father's big red Mercedes station wagon, which was kind of like a small SUV. And you have to keep in mind that this is Europe and your average car is about yay big. Right. They just come out with a smart car that was made by the same people who made the smartwatch, Swatch. And this was huge and it was diesel. So we made quite the spectacle of ourselves uh, driving across uh, Europe and eventually winding up on the Cornwall Peninsula and then taking the Roscoff Plymouth Ferry across to Cornwall. And we had all kinds of interesting synchronistic events that we were following, kind of following our noses into one mystery after another. And I realized at the time I was trying to come up with a, a good premise for a, a book on shamanism. And I didn't want to write just another book on shamanism, a kind of a textbook. And I realized a few days into this trip that I should really keep a journal more so than I ordinarily did uh, because this was going to be a good foundation, a good narrative for a book and it turned out to be so. And it's gotten really good rave reviews, uh, which I'm thrilled by. So by all means, give it a read and enjoy it. And then when you're ready for some deeper nitty gritty work, you can read the book that I wrote that to avoid writing, which is the uh, post tribal shamanism. So those have been out. See, I, I think I, I published uh, Dance of Stones. This is the original cover of Dance of Stones. And I believe the publication date was 2008. Yes, 2008. And then 
It's been re-released by the lovely people at Moon Books in, I think it was 20, I don't know. Rachel, do you know? No, never mind. So, <laughs> sometime after, I think it was like 10 years after that, that came out. And then the year after that, Moon Books also released uh, Post-Travel Shamanism. So that would be a great way to start with this version of shamanism. Uh, with other classical versions of shamanism, of course, Mircea Elia Ade's uh, shamanism, archaic techniques of shamanism, uh, ecstasy, uh, is very outdated. And a lot of his theories have been kind of discredited, but it still has a wealth of field studies. So you get to look at the observations that different people were making of shamanic cultures and what was going on and the parallels between them. Because one of the things that we see clearly is that these people living in different parts of the world probably did not all arise from the same system. And so the fact that they have very similar maps of their spirit worlds may indicate that they're actually valid and that they are encountering the same thing. And it's really, it's much like what I talk about around soul awareness. You know, soul awareness is something that we are experiencing vividly when we go into that state that takes us outside of time and space and into non-dual awareness, right? And when you read the Upanishads, which were written, what, 6,000 years ago, and those were from oral sources that had been around who knows how long before that, it's like reading a journal of somebody who just had the same experience you did. So we can see that these same practices and thus the uh, spiritual technology, the spiritual geography, if you will, that these arise from are identical now as they were 6,000 years ago. What has changed is culture, society, our own individuation. Uh, but that root, that root of soul awareness is identical. And it's, it's right there, it's accessible to each and every person. There is another wonderful resource that I want to mention before we run out of time here in the next few minutes. And that is this thing called the Insight Timer app on your smartphone. It's available both on iPhones and Android. And I do have some uh, meditations for want of a better word on that app that are free of charge. I did have my own app for a while, but it was so hard to <laughs> keep up with all the bugs that when uh, we found Insight app, it just seemed the best way to publish those. So that has a resting in soul awareness, which is what I would recommend initially. There's also a movement into shamanic body exercise and movement into medicine body exercise a drumming for the shamanic journey. Okay, I think that's all I've got up at the moment. I do have some other things that I may well publish there as well. So any other questions as we wrap up? I think I have time possibly for one more question, if anything pops up. Do you have, do you have any set daily spiritual practices? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I have been meditating daily, you know, resting in soul awareness daily for years. Really, I've had a pretty rigorous daily practice since my early 20s. And currently that looks like I get up at six o'clock in the morning, go in and sit for at least 20 minutes and often do some journeying then uh, talking to grandfather, talking to the ancestors, sometimes doing soul retrieval, sometimes doing other healing work, uh, sometimes drumming, sometimes chanting, various things. But the root of that is that 
resting in soul awareness because that really kind of keeps everything primed so that when I have the opportunity to move into uh, shamanic states in the medicine body, you know, I'm ready to go. And as a shaman, you know, this is my day job. You know, I teach, but I also see clients. I, I have a client in a couple hours and I need to be ready walking in the door to be able to drop into shamanic body and go do work for them, be there in service to them. And so I have an obligation to do my own work, to be present to my own healing process. And that is an ongoing process, I assure you. you know, um, I'm still healing from the traumas I experienced as a child and then the trauma I added on top of that as an adult. But the process is good. The process is valuable and meaningful. And it has gotten to the point where I'm now a point in my life where I love my work. I am incredibly blessed with a family that I couldn't have dreamed of. A, a wife who is the, absolutely the right partner for me, who is an equal and amazing, has wonderful superpowers. And we both won the lottery with each other and with our amazing and talented daughter, Megan. And so, yeah, I, I would not have any of that if it was not for all the work that I've done with grandfather, with my, my mentor, Elisheva, with therapists and such, but mainly just doing the work and doing the work of soul awareness in and of itself doesn't solve everything you know you still have to go into observer mind and observe the stuff as it comes up observe the trauma observe the toxins and allow them to dissolve and dissolve the shempa and that takes rigorous persistent work over a period of years and it is absolutely worthwhile i cannot recommend it highly enough okay so a good place to start start your meditation practice start sitting every day read some good books um, ask some questions feel free to get in touch with me uh, through Moon Books or through my website. I have a website, shamanstouch.com. And I have, ah, there we go. Uh, that's my website there. And uh, let's say I have a lot of articles available through uh, Indie Shaman and various and sundry other publications. I have essays in a number of Moon Books uh, anthologies. So there's plenty of places to get a hold of me. Feel free to get in touch with any questions. And with that, I wish you all the blessings of the ancestors and may your journey go well. And thank you so much. I appreciate it.